Professor Ramamurthy is an ethnographer with transdisciplinary reach. She has published in journals focusing on development, anthropology, gender, and feminist theory. Her work engages with political economy and issues of class and, and caste, uh, issues of gender formation, transnational feminism, among other currents. Uh, I'm gonna keep my, my remarks brief and just tell you the title of our talk. Today is, is uh, Delhi of Tosis, Dostis, what kind of brotherhood? Please join me in welcoming Professor Ramamurthy. Uh, so thank you all for coming at the end of very rich three days of talks and panel discussions. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers of RC21 for inviting is it, and- Is it loud enough? Is it on? Is that better? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry. So uh, I'll start again since it's with thanking all of you for coming at the end of a very rich three days of talks and panel discussions. I'd like to thank the organizers of RC21 uh, for hosting me and inviting me. The concept note for the conference, In and Beyond the City, Emerging Ontologies, Persistent Challenges and Hopeful Futures, inspired me to respond. In this very preliminary articulation, I ask what friendship as an analytic offers us to rethink urban politics in and beyond the city. Sociologists, anthropologists, and geographers have not paid much attention to friendship as an analytic, in part because it is a slippery concept. But I'd like to explore its contours as a field of social relatedness in the city and beyond. What it renders fixed and fluid in people's everyday social worlds particularly the worlds of rural migrants to the city, may offer us a basis for comparative projects as well. Can friendship offer us insights into everyday ontologies, which to quote the concept note, surpass the gaze and grip of the city? The dynamics of transformation in the contemporary world requires conceptualizing the mutual imprint of the city and the country as entangled. Whether looking towards the rural from the urban or towards the urban from the rural, there is ample reason to theorize the urban and rural as entangled in heterogeneous ways, empirically and imaginatively. Can friendship offer us ways of mapping and understanding these entanglements? The imperative to challenge the persistent inequalities, inadequacies, and injustices of cities is the second aspect of the concept note for this conference. In response, I ask, how does the city figure in the imaginations and experiences of men as a space of possibility for friendships not defined by inequality in India of unequal class, education, caste, and land relations? Not just discursively, but materially and affectively, do friendships offer insights into forms of affiliation which support and cradle the urban poor through the city's violences and insecurities? What do the social geographies of friendship and their varying spatio-temporalities tell us about the operation of power and difference? Lastly, do trajectories of friendship offer pedagogies to learn, as the concept note incites us to do, about hopeful futures that may be unfolding over urban terrains? Along with the geographers who suggest that radical praxis is about finding wiggle room, the ceaseless and creative struggle against objectification of labor by capitalist logics, I ask if friendship offers social scientists and working class migrants spaces of hopeful, dynamic, and relational sociality integral to the city as a place of possibility. Placing Delhi in the same frame of reference as male friendships immediately conjures up images of groups of young men roaming, loitering, drinking, gambling, watching porn, doing drugs, and relishing in numb, chilling, criminal, and sexual violence. Not just in India, but internationally, Delhi has come to be signified by the brutal rape of Jyoti Singh Pandey in 2012, the land mafias of Gurgaon, Gurugram, routine sexual harassment of women on its streets and buses, high rates of domestic violence, and low female sex ratios. Infamous as the rape capital of India, feminist analysis of Delhi has focused on the hardening of binary sex difference, who is regarded as properly male and female in a changing gender regime one in which women and girls seen to be modern, educated, and seeking upward class mobility are in paid employment in the public sphere more than in previous generations. Faced with a shortage of jobs, 
a shortage of educational opportunities, and no hope that pathways of upward mobility will open up, feminist scholars have argued, adolescent males have responded with an extreme control of female sexuality through greater assertion of limits on the mobility of women, their friends and romances, their work, their dress, their cell phones, and their sexual autonomy. Feminist scholars have also suggested that the rapid expansion of cities of which Delhi is paradigmatic into its rural hinterlands has heightened social tensions. Village gender, caste, and class hierarchies still hold in these peri-urban places, it is posited, leading to a perpetual feeling of disorientation. Left out of circuits of cultural capital and feeling like village hicks in cosmopolitan urban Delhi, leads some of these now rich young men with no need to work to turn to their only source of self-worth, a muscular masculinity. The saturation of the cultural sphere in Delhi, and indeed all India with an overwhelming Hindutva militant masculinity, heightens this violent gender regime. In short, multiple unfolding processes have overdetermined the prevalence and significance of male violence in Delhi, leading feminist scholarship and activism to focus on it. Feminist activism against patriarchal violence in Delhi has a very long history. Just one inspiring example of current feminist mobilization is Pindra Thod, Break the Cage, the autonomous collective of female students in Delhi colleges. There is much to be done to smash patriarchy and hegemonic masculinities. Nevertheless, there is so much more to Delhi than violent masculinities. In this talk, I'd like to share stories of friendships of male working class migrants to Delhi, those who work mostly intermittently in its informal economies, and one youth who aspires to more. Without Bihari's Delhi would be Khokla, or hollow, a young man from Bihar state told us, and he was right. Delhi has a migrant population of more than 63 lakhs, or 6.3 uh, million, Migrants make up 40% of the population of the city, probably more since they are constantly on the move and notoriously difficult for census surveys to count. Most migration to Delhi, over two thirds, is from the North Indian states of UP, Bihar, Haryana, and Uttarakhand, as this map of railway journey shows. All the stories we will hear today are of migrants from the north, the states of UP and Bihar in particular. Migrants from different regions tend to stay in different parts of Delhi, uh, and our stories are uh, from the middle dots uh, in, these ma in this map. Males coming to Delhi in search of work is the largest migrant stream into the city. Most come as single men before marriage. On marriage, many leave their wives and children behind in the village. Translocal households, which straddle the city and the village, with left behind parents, siblings, wives, and children, are the norm in North India where regional patriarchies are stronger than in the South. The relative cost in the city and the village of reproduction, especially of housing, education, and healthcare, the need for family labor, for cultivation, and elder care, aspirations, alienation, loneliness, and depression in the city and the village, all influence translocal householding strategies, who stays in the village, who is called to the city, who is sent back. Delhi runs on its informal economy, and the informal economy depends on working class labor, especially the labor of migrants to reproduce itself. Street vending, waste collection, recycling, domestic restaurant and hotel service work, sex work, beauty salon work, retail sales, construction and transportation are just some examples of informal economy jobs. So are shop floor work in unregistered enterprises from automobile repair shops to industrial sweatshops, which make everything from garments to textiles and plastic and stainless steel products. At the All India level, a recent study by Azim Premji University researchers estimated that 83% of the total workforce works in the informal economy. In recent years, the increasing informalization of previously secure or formal jobs in manufacturing and in the service sector has added to these numbers. The conditions of work in the informal economy are precarious. More than 70% depend on oral contracts without security of tenure or legal protections. Informal economy work lacks health, housing, pension, and social security benefits. Puzzled by its perseverance and growth, scholars have characterized the informal economy in many ways. I will not be debating the relative merits of these theorizations, except to say that the informal economy constitutes a regime of accumulation, which depends on multiple forms of difference and differentiation of the working class. Henry Bernstein's classes of labor 
is an apt description of this fragmentation and pluralization of working classes in the informal economy. They are likely to combine all kinds of wage labor with all kinds of self-employment and, and I quote, pursue their means of reproduction across different sites of the social division of labor, urban and rural, agricultural and non-agricultural, wage employment and self-employment. While we are beginning to understand the contours of the informal economy better, we continue to know relatively little about the life worlds of the women and men who fabricate livelihoods in the informal economy. My larger collaborative project with Professor Vinay Gidwani, titled The Country and the City for a Poetics of Urban Informal Economies in India, which we began in, the mid in mid 2015, is a modest attempt to do just that. In recently published essays, we've taken up female lives in the informal economy and the intersectional politics of social reproduction. Here, I would like to explore dosti or friendship, its practices and experiences, its vital forms of affiliation for working class men. The broader question I'd like to ask is by politicizing urban space through friendships, what comes into view? Dosti, friendship in Hindi and Urdu, is available in everyday discourse in India as expression of social relatedness. It tells you something about the person in relation to other persons or how personhood and the self are defined through relatedness. Dostana, Yarana, Mitrita are other Hindi or Urdu expressions for friendship. Every Indian language has many words for friendship, though the stories I will share today are of Hindi and Urdu speakers. These terms could be applied to same or cross-gender friendships. Bhayachari, the Hindi word for brotherhood, is specifically used for men in homosocial relations with other men. Popular culture, Indian literature and film, provide us with many renditions of male-male friendships in urban contexts. Think Amar Akbar Anthony or Three Idiots. Cinema studies scholars have analyzed these idealized representations, but social scientists have not. Surprisingly, studies of masculinity in India have not focused on friendship as an analytic. The main tendency of contemporary masculinity studies is to focus, and I quote, the domination, exploitation, oppression of the female by the male, uh, and I'm quoting Chopra or Sela and Sela. When male relations with other males are considered ethnographically, it is the performance of masculinity by men towards other collectivities of men in the family, as guru mentors, as iconic heroes and god stars, employers and sportsmen, which are scrutinized. Notably, this is a hierarchized masculinity. Though Chopra, Osela, and Osela suggest that reciprocity exchange and an egalitarian spirit could seed masculine cultures, it is to hyper-masculine performances that the ethnographies turn. New studies of sexualities in India have opened up the concept of masculinities in exciting ways, productively moving us away from an obsession with, and I quote again, aggression and erotics as the only male stance towards the female, to provide understandings of the heterogeneous spaces where homo, hetero, and alternate sexualities are imagined, enacted, and experienced. Friendship hovers over many of the studies in the recent volumes on masculinities by Chopra, Sela, and Sela, and Srivastava, but, but again, it's not an analytic that is mined. An, an exception to the general lack of interest in friendship is Gayatri Reddy's chapter in Srivastava's edited volume on sexualities, which compares hijra communities, which are more, and I quote her, traditional, with hierarchies organized around kinship, and gay communities, which are more modern, with friendships undergirded by an ideology of equality, though these lines are not strictly demarcated. The names of the gay magazine Bombay Dost, Bombay Friend, and an important anthology in English published in 1999, Yarana, Gay Writing in India, by Hoshang Merchant, lends support to Rendi, Reddy's nod to friendship as a de defining form of male gay identity in the metropolis. Perhaps now that the fight to read back 377 has been won, LGBTQ scholar activists will turn to friendship as an analytic, as Gautam and I were just chatting about. So to the outline of the talk and the main arguments. In the first section, I tell the story of Basti or slum friendships and unfriending among male youth in Delhi, one in particular, who is the son of a migrant. The social geographies of friendship shape urban subjectivities inter and intra-locally in Delhi Bastis and trans-locally across the city and the village. In the process, difference, class and caste in this instance, is reproduced and struggled against to remake the spaces of the city, of the provincial town, and of the village. 
In the second section, I draw on the oral histories of another migrant who is 40 and has migrated to at least five cities since he was 12 to argue that male friendships are embedded in a moral economy of care, which uh, shapes the urban experience. Village and kin neighborhood communities set up grids of expectation of care, which prefigure the move from the village. Once in the city, single male rural migrants live in shared accommodations and share care. These caring friendships are a hidden abode of contemporary capitalism, which provision and cradle them against the worst abuses of the informal economy. But they may as easily go awry. The urban experience of cities as particular cities is judged on their moral economies of care, whether based on grids of expectation of friendship set up by village social stances towards care or other affective logics. In the third section, I consider dissident friendships, which diverge from capitalist and normative scripts and times. Organized, cultivated, enduring, and ephemeral, these kinds of brotherhood build communities of support and affect across difference. In conclusion, I ask if friendships between social scientists and working class migrants offer us wiggle room, spaces for overlooked modes of social existence, which speak to non or a capitalist affective capacities and potentials, go to, to quote uh, Neferti, Tadyal, and Vinay Is friendship then a space of hopefulness? The Delhi of Bastis, Unfriending Difference and Remaking Space. Delhi figures as a city of possibility, a space of dostis or friendships for social relations not defined by class or caste in the imagination of migrants. The actual experience of the city, however, is fraught with betrayal. Devender, a handsome, self-possessed and ambitious young man in his early 20s, lives in the slum or JJ colony of Samaipur Bhanti with his father, his mother and his younger sister. When he was a child, he recalls thinking his jhuggi or thatch hut was, as he puts it using the English word, normal, because everyone else in the basti lived in a thatch shack too, and they all leaked in the rain. Although pakka concrete auto-constructed houses have replaced thatch shacks, I don't tell, any, I don't tell people I'm from Samaipur Badli, the basti, unless they specifically ask, they when their confides. If I do, their perspective, nazaria, changes. He goes on to explain, I had a dost, a friend in school. He was from Bhalswa. His name was Dilshad Alam, and we knew each other really well. We'd eat and drink together. Sometimes he'd taunt me, ton karte the, because I lived in a shack. He'd tell me, he'd tell others that I lived in a shack behind my back. I was popular in class. I did well in my studies. I was a good athlete, so he couldn't neglect me. But he'd tell the others who came from areas like Shalimar and Badli, a uh, now gentrified area uh, just across from uh, Samaipur, uh, just adjacent actually to the Chupi Chopri uh, colony. These people from Badli, uh, so here's a picture of uh, looking towards Badli village from the JJ colony. And you can see that the park in between the two uh, is filled up with garbage. It's also where working class men from the Jogi Jobri colony have to go to shit every morning and sometimes get uh, hit with beer bottles uh, by the people overlooking them uh, from uh, the, ten of the apartments in uh, Bali. Uh, so to get back to uh, the quotation, uh, nowadays, I bump into them, these those from time to time, but there's not much left of our friendship because they still see me as a shack dweller. The same is true with Dilshad. Jhopri, Jhopri, he'd keep rubbing it in endlessly. Later, he accused me of taking too many favors. I asked his friends, don't we all take favors? To which he replied, it's causing a crack in our friendship. Your thinking is different. Teri baat aur hai. The city is foundational to young men's imaginings of friendship not defined by class, but locality, where one stays within the city, proximity next to whom one stays, and the quality of housing as reference of class matter acutely in youth friendships. Friendships fade, even implode, as power operates through them to define who can be friends and who is excluded. Dilshad Devendra's friend who demeaned him for living in a shack in a basti belongs to a minority community himself. His name suggests he's Muslim in a Hindu majority city and his own home is in Bhalsava, which is by no means posh. 
Balsawa is across the river from Samepur Badli where Devendra lives and is infamous for its municipal landfill piled up mile high with garbage. But it also has newer housing um, stock. Yet the assertion of relative differences between the built environments of these areas impede the promise of friendship predicated on lateral forms of relatedness between equals. In classical philosophy, Aristotle idealized friendship as a public form of affiliation between men who can be equal in horizontal relationships. Feminist scholars criticized this conception as, 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 andro, as androcentric and homophilic, but hold on to friendship's utopian possibilities despite its difficulties and ambiguities, contradictions and failures. We return to these possibilities in the course of this talk. Even as class difference constrains and limits friendships in Devendra's life, it is also central to the aspirational appeal of his friendships. In college, Devendra makes upper class toast. They think I live in Bhatli, that is uh, the gentrified village, he says. They come in cars since the 12th grade I've had to work. They get money from home to roam around. Devendra thinks of his future in terms of a time when he will give my parents a good life. I want to be known as Devendra, who is an expert in such and such field. My circle of college friends are all from very good families. Till now, we have all been recognized as students. But soon I will hear, I'm in this pose, I'm at the CEO of this company. I want to become someone too. Let them not be able to say, you've been left low, tum ni ja They won't say anything to me directly, but they'll think he's remained below us. When I occupy a big post, I won't disdain those below me. I look at my college friends today and think, how carefree they are, kitne must hain. I have to work while they're all doing their MBAs or something else. Their dad had, if my dad had been someone, I too wouldn't have had to work. I would have been able to pursue anything I chose. There's no one in the, my busi with whom I can sit and study. I go to my friends or sector 18 in Rohini, a middle class neighborhood which adjoins the busti, to study. My middle class friends say, if I can't make it, my dad will fix things. Mere papa kara denge. They are competitive exams to enter a profession. They are taking competitive exams to enter a profession, but free, free of the sort of stress I feel. It's my helplessness, majburi, that makes me feel, if this doesn't work, that's it. My friends have separate rooms, which are really nice to study in. I stay with one or another of them for the duration of the exams. They want me to take me, uh, they want me to take them to my home, but I tell them there's a problem. They react, everything's fine, but the moment we say to this guy, take us home, something happens to him. I've never brought a friend home. I meet them in Badli. I bought a scooty so they won't even have to come to Badli village to drop me and pick me up anymore. I'm reluctant for them to do so. I'm not ashamed, but I'm not proud either. If someone asks me, do you still have a jhugi mentality, jhugi ka soch rakha hai kya, and he comes to know I'm from there, he'll doubtlessly surmise that it's true. They were in these reflections on friendship uh, with upper class friends, the possibility of cross class friendships and their frigi fragility is borne out in anthropological studies of friendship more generally. Evans observes, due to historical circumstances, some people have more choice than others, both within a society and when comparing one society with another, about whom they can bring themselves into being in relation to. The concept of relatedness, this idea of bringing themselves into being in relation to, acknowledges how power operates in friendships, that is how friendship is possible and negotiated, but often reproduces social inequities. Devendra holds on to the possibility of lateral relationships with his upper class college friends, even as he knows that these horizontal relations are more possible now when they are all socially legible as students. As they strive to enter the sphere of work, friendship provides them with experience and an analytic of their class privilege, from the cars to their own rooms, from not having to work and being able to prepare for exams stress-free. Devendra is determined to not be cast as a left behind now or in the future. And since being left behind is spatially fixed to the locality and habits, Devendra carefully orchestrates where his upper class friends thinks he lives and never invites them home. Delhi, the city, figures in young man's imaginings of a space of possibility of friendships not defined by caste either. Devendra recalls, I had a friend, a childhood friend from here, the Basti. He'd come first at times, and I would at others. In the end, neither he nor I came first. We were seventh or eighth in class rank. 
That's when we found out that there were students who were smarter than we were. Till then, I didn't know anything about caste. I knew only that there was caste in the village. We were in the eighth class by then and only looked out for each other, no one else. One day he asked, what caste are you? I didn't know. I asked my dad, what caste are we? He said, why do you need to know? And then he told me, Harijan. Harijan is the name of previously untouchable caste communities, so low as to be rendered outside the caste hierarchy in India. So I went back and told my friend Harijan, at which my friend said, but we don't even touch them. Hum usse chute bhi nahi. But you touch me fully, but tu to full chuta hai. I responded. <laughs> After that, ever so slowly, our friendship broke up. Whenever he would speak up, I would speak up too. And he began to feel angered by this. We tried to mend our friendship a couple of times. In the 10th grade, he got a few more marks than me. In the Vinder's narrative, equality between friends predicated on being equally meritorious in school is juxtaposed with the inequality of the caste system. Despite having similar class ranks, he discovers that horizontal friendship becomes impossible when caste is inserted into these practices. Devendra's tuto full chuta hai, you touch me fully, refers to forms of closeness expressive of male friendships in India. Male those demonstrate affection through touch. Young men walking hand in hand or with their arms around each other's shoulders as they roam, humor, or loiter in public spaces are common sights, so common that they are unremarkable. Homosocial intimacy is expressed as well by sharing food, chai, and cigarettes, watching films and videos together, and more recently watching porn on cell phone, often sharing leads or earbuds. Devinder's astonishment is a response to his friend who suddenly practices caste-based untouchability after, em after embracing him fully as a friend in these intimate, physically tactile ways. Devinder's experience of caste in the city is colored by his experience of caste in the village, which is a violence. In 1986, his father had to flee his village of Kirtegera, uh, which is a caste-segregated uh, village with upper caste Rajput landowning Thakurs, where uh, in uh, 1986, these Thakurs beat him up extremely badly after falsely accusing him of damaging one of their trucks. Again, about seven or eight years ago, one of the village Thakurs interfered in the case Devinder's family wanted to file against his sister's in-laws for her murder. We are not of the village any longer, and even if we are, we live in Delhi now, Devinder states. When we went to meet him, the Thakur told us, sit down on the floor. My father said, why should I? He said, because you belong to a low caste. When we are at a higher level than him now, we own a flat, we own land. My father went straight to the police station to lodge the case. At the time, the police listened more than they have in the past because Mayavati, a Dalit chief minister, was in power. My sister's brother-in-law is still in jail for her murder. Nevertheless, Devendra now says, I'd like to settle in the village. I have more relationships there. Even as he acknowledges, there's casteism in the village. In the provincial town of Fatehpur, where my flat is, so this is Fatehpur on the map, um, which is just close to Ghansingpur and Kirti Khera, which are his mother's village, Ghansingpur, and uh, Kirti Khera, which is his father's village, as I just mentioned. So uh, they bought, the flat that they bought is in Fatehpur. It's, not, it's close enough to the villages, but it's actually in this provincial town of Fatehpur. So where my flat is, there are educated people. Just in my lane in Ambedkar Nagar, which is a Dalit community, there are two lawyers and my uncle is a manager. The flat is 15 kilometers from the village. In the village, my relatives form my circle of friends, and I make friends with their friends. Unke dos ke saath bhi dosti ho jati hai. I can't talk to people here in Delhi the way I can talk to my relatives. Devendra's maps of his day in Delhi, uh, which is on your right, and his day in Fatehpur and his mother's and father's villages represent his social worlds in each. On the left, Devendra uh, represents his day in Delhi in regimented straight lines, broken up into precise time slots in which he does the same activity every single day. He mentions only one college friend and no fun activities. On the right, 
Devendra represents his life in the provincial town of Fatipur and in his father's and mother's villages, brimming with friendships which, and I'm quoting him, childhood friends, close relative, neighbors' attachment. With these childhood neighbors and kin friends, he roams fields, gardens, orchards, markets, temples, and restaurants. As he notes, he eats with them, drinks with them, shops, gossips, and has fun. Devinder's oral history and mental maps suggest that while the Delhi of segregated busties and middle class neighborhoods may be hard to desegregate by friendships, provincial towns may be those in between places where refuge from the class and caste inequalities of the city and the village may be sought by Dalit working class migrants who have achieved a modicum of stability. People whom Vinay Gidwani and I characterize as uh, middle migrants. Devendra's father is a middle migrant. After migrating from his village with nothing, he lived on the New Delhi railway station platform. An unknown brother, Bhai Sahib, he tells us, came by and asked, do you want a job? And took him to do construction day labor. Next, he worked in an unauthorized industrial unit as a fitter. More educated than the rest of the workers, he began demanding changes in wages and how employees were treated and got into trouble. After eight years with the unit, he tried out garment selling off a cart in the streets of Old Delhi Market. And after uh, two weeks of doing this, decided that this was a good livelihood and quit the unit. In the meantime, in between these livelihoods, his wife picked up a job in a slipper-making unit in Badri. She has been promoted to the position of a checker. Once Devinder's dad's street business picked up, the family saved all of his, his wife's earnings. They built the Jhugi shack in Badli after a neighbor told them to do so, then made it pakka or permanent with bricks. Devinder's dad invested in land in his wife's village. If you don't have land, people taunt you. Tana deete hain. He also bought a plot of land in Swarupnagar and another plot in Narela. He's yet to build houses on those. As he mentioned, he's built a flat in Fatehpur where he'd love to start a, a textile shop, but his figures that he'd need an investment of five to six lakhs for that, as in small towns, you need to have a wide range of inventory. Here he manages with a capital of 50,000. In the end, he will settle wherever Devendra decides to. He has created many options to provide alternatives, so his family will not be haunted by where they live and can choose the friends that they keep. The admittedly few ethnographies of friendship in India have explored how friendships as expressed and experienced offer an important space for articulations of personhood within caste groups and distinct from caste. The girls and Jane Dyson's wonderful study of friendship in Uttarakhand villages, for instance, are all of the same caste. They live next to each other. Their daily cycles of work and leisure are easily coordinated. They have no opportunity to form relationship with girls of other caste communities. These possibilities are also explored in Desai, Fora, and Osela and Osela. Devendra's friendships add to these ethnographies by drawing our attention to the spatial geographies of friendship in Delhi's northwest within and across Bastis and middle class localities. The importance of moving within Delhi and back to provincial towns as in between places in the continuing entanglements of the city and the village offer a glimpse into the complex connections between friendship, class and caste and the possibility of resisting the social reproduction of caste and class inequality. Uh, so this is uh, in the village of Gansingpur, which we visited, and uh, that's Devinder uh, with a friend of his uh, going off from the fields. Uh, and this is Fatehpur. This is the second section of the paper, Translocal Friendships and the Urban Experience, Moral Economies of Care. Mumtaz, a dapper, dignified, thoughtful man of around 40, has been migrating for work from his village of Garhara in eastern Bihar, over 1,300 kilometers from Delhi for more than 25 years. Like many North Indian migrants, Mumtaz has lived away from his village to work in India's urban informal economies for the past uh, 20 years. He has worked as a power loom operator filing shuttles in the power loom textile sweatshops of Bhivandi near Bombay. He has woven thick cotton bedspreads and dharis in the power looms of Ludhiana. He has worked as a fabricator in an industrial sweatshop in North Delhi. He has stitched cotton garments in Southeast Delhi, then back to the Ludhiana to stitch hosiery as a piece rate worker, and then back to Delhi again as a ladies line garment worker. Now, since the past 12 years, he works as a pune, a daily wage employee on contract in a government university here. 
In between, he has returned to the village for longer spells at least three times to try and make a living there. In conversations, male migrants like him from North India who have left their families behind commonly, commonly describe cities as Pardesh, another country, or Bidesh, a foreign country, even those who have lived and worked in the city for two decades or more. Correspondingly, their villages are referred to as Desh. Mumtaz left his village the first time because there were problems in his village. His family was suffering with too little land and constant floods. He didn't want to follow the family tradition of becoming a Maulvi, finding Islamic education with his father in the madrasa too narrow. He had no choice but to leave. He remembers feeling utterly desolate. The first time I left home, I cried quite a bit. Hearing me cry, everyone from my mohalla or neighborhood gathered around. I wondered, where am I going? Will I ever return? I traveled from Purnia, the provincial town near Garhara, to Patna in a bus, and from there in a train. I went to Bhivandi, where my brother was. When I saw Patna, the big city, for the first time, I thought, the world ends here. When I boarded the train, I wondered, where can all these multitudes be going? When I reached Bombay, I thought, the world ends here. A few months after I reached Bhivandi, the Pawalum textile town where a number of men from Mumtaz's village still go, a few guys, Ladke, said, we are going to Bombay, want to come? I said, yes. I loved movies at the time. I wanted to see where my heroes lived. When I stood on the ocean so shore, I said, surely the world ends here. But the guys I was with said, the world is huge. At the time, I wasn't worldly wise. Just work and more work. And we got any time off, go see a film. In Bhavandi, Mumtaz and his village friends stayed in a room next to the textile factory. 12 or 13 of them slept in it by rotation. When the day workers left, the night workers slept. For everything, there was a line. A line for the toilet, a line for the bath, a line for your food, a line to work. To eat, to drink, there was a canteen. 50 to 60 people would eat there. We'd have to pay them for the month. If you didn't want to eat there, you'd have to take your tiffin box, fill it up, and bring it back to the room to eat. We didn't even have a glass to drink water in the rooms. Once in a way, someone would buy a two, three liter of water, and we'd all drink from it. If a milne jhulne wala, a friend, came to hang out, we'd have to take him too to the line to eat. I've been back and forth to Bhivandi several times. The first time I stayed six months, tops. I fell ill with jaundice and came back to the village. Those days, if you felt sick for four or five days, then they'd say, send him back to the village. A couple of people had died from falling sick in Bhivandi. In th those days, five or six people would always come and go together to the village. After six or five or six months in the village, I returned to Bombay to the power looms. Two or three months later, I fell ill again. I came back to the village for two or three months, and then a few people were going to Ludhiana, so I went along with them. Village kinship ties and friendships, especially those with extended kin groups, prefigure the migration trajectories of young men like Mumtaz from the village to the city. As word comes back to their neighborhood or mohalla and circulates that so-and-so's son has been sending so much money home, Mumtaz explained, young men are drawn to migrate to fulfill the dream that they too will earn bountifully and send money back to support their families in the village. Uh, Chinmay Thumbe has been working on this, and he shows uh, through these maps comparing uh, India in 1901 and 2007 uh, that, in fact, migration stream from particular areas has been remarkably durable. So this was the uh, uh, map of uh, 1901, and this is the map of 2007. Very often we found in our oral histories the particular city to which males migrate is determined by these mohalla friendships. Invariably, the kind of informal economy work one ends up doing, uh, power loom weaving in Mumtaz's case and later garment stitching, is because a friend does it and shares information about where the openings are. In many oral histories, we found instances of men generously taking a friend under their wing in unofficial apprenticeships, or even telling each other how to fake a skill to get a foothold and learn on the job. As significantly, once in a new city, men stay in dorms or share rented rooms with friends or relatives till they find a job and a place to stay. Male migrants who share accommodations share caring labor with their friends, doing the work of tending shopping for food, cooking, washing, cleaning, providing friends and relatives with temporary accommodations, taking care of the ill, accompanying them back to the village for care, is felt as a moral obligation to their mohalla communities. 
The feminist research on care has been important in documenting the central contradiction of capitalism. It needs workers, but it squeezes them to extract surplus labor and accumulate capital. The ratcheting up of crises of care in extant forms of capitalism, often labeled neoliberalism, has been proven. But while the enrollment of female labor, paid and unpaid, material and affective, public, domestic, and intimate in care work has been studied, forms of male caring labor have not. This despite the fundamental contribution of feminism that the sexual division of labor in the household bet between caring and other kinds of work is socially constructed. In other words, there is nothing intrinsically natural to which gender does the work of caring. Biological reproduction aside, this encompasses all the domestic work of cooking, cleaning, looking after the ill, disabled children, the elderly, and the work of socializing children to normative behaviors. How people are assigned to embodied sex difference has nothing to do with whether they care for or care about. Care labor is gender neutral. Mumtaz's story is important as a sto story of male friends doing the work of tending when female labor is unavailable. In Mumtaz's story and many others, friendship is a network of support critical to urban informal economy workers, a form of filiation of compassionate friendship in the face of health crises, job insecurity, and last housing inadequacy. Caring friendships then subtend the lives of urban informal workers materially, but as importantly provide them with emotional, affective, and intimate succor by being present for the other. Mumtaz's experiences of cities as particular cities are tied to his friends, co-workers, and bosses' moral capacities to care. In Bombay, friends and relatives won't even let you stay in their room a few days. At least in Delhi, they will open their doors and people still care for each other. He also explained, I stayed in Ludhiana for three or four months. I didn't like Ludhiana. The way people spoke, the language they used was vulgar. Every sentence was laced with insults to one's sisters, so I came away. It's true that people cuss in every city, but at that time, I couldn't tolerate it. Bardash ne kar paya. I returned from Ludhiana to the village and began learning garment tailoring. Later, he returned to Ludhiana again. A friend said we should work in hosiery. Come on, let's go to Ludhiana to a different company. This he didn't tell me what hosiery work is. Just let's go. And we learned so much. He told me actually somewhat more than we could make. I got there and found out that we have to have our own machines. I asked the guy, why didn't you tell me this beforehand? Then I went and stayed with a relative in Ludhiana who worked in a power loom factory. The worker was a, the owner was a Sardar from Banaras. He had 10 pairs of machines. The bed cover season lasted three to four months. When it ended, I returned to Delhi. The Sardar talked and thought right. Once or twice he invited me to his home. He told me my home too is in Bihar. I've bought a little land there. He told me the names of a couple of places in Bihar. I told him I dislike one thing here, the way people swear all the time. He said, me too. Have you ever heard me mouth off hate? We became friends of a sort. Dostana vyavar hua. He asked me to go along with him when he listened to prayers in the Gurwada. I went along. After the season ended, he told me, don't leave, we'll start another kind of work. The machines needed to be reconfigured, but the local sardars were inattentive to him. Anna kani ho gaya. A month went by. He covered all my expenses for that month, but then he told me, you better go. I'll send a letter to your village and inform you when the factory is ready. He told me because I'm from Bihar, the local Sardarjis give me a run around. We do peeps work and he'd feed us. Of course, there are friendships that go awry with moral turpitude. Mumtaz recounts, after a little while in Delhi, I went to Bombay. I fell into bad company, the kind into drinking and gambling. I haven't gambled to date and hadn't drunk till then. I said to one friend, give me some money, I'd like to go back to the village. But there isn't, uh, but here there isn't, because here there isn't work anymore. He said, let's do one thing, let's start a khoka, an unauthorized business. Each morning, the wholesale vegetable and fruit vendors get boxes and gunny sacks full of fresh ware. Some of it gets squashed, bruised in the packing. We'd pick it up, give the guy 50 paise, one rupee. When we had collected 50 or 100 kilos of tomatoes, we'd put them on a streetcar to the market under near the Dadar flyover. It was filthy, stank of piss. One day, the committee, which is the municipal corporation guys, came after the guy in front of me. They beat him up with sticks. I ran back and never returned. The police appeared and said, disband this. I got scared. Work so hard, work in a filthy place, and on top of that, get beaten up. I told this guy with a regular stall in the vegetable market, give me a job here. 
I'll do it. But a month later, I left. There were dis disagreements in the market between the Deobandi and Bareilly followers, uh, which is two different branches of Islamic theology, which uh, Mumtaz does not believe in. I left and went to Delhi. To return to the beginning of Mumtaz's story, migration and his telling is spurred by the agrarian crisis, and the land his family owned is insufficient to provision their needs even minimally, and his need to escape from a narrow, non-secular education. The fight between Deobandi and Bareilly followers in his village dismays him. He considers these un-Islamic, and so, of course, when this fight followed him to Bombay, he left there as well. Village Mohalla friendships prefigure his move to the city, and once they provide him with a modicum of space outside of relenting work, to see and learn the world, to enjoy a film, to share a meal. Friendships which share the labor of care, subtend work in the informal economy. They create capacities to labor through the work of tending to the bodies and psyches of laborers in need of repair and rejuvenation when they are spent. Male migrants feel no compulsion to continue in informal economy jobs when they are moved by a moral economy of care to leave them to fulfill their obligations of care for their friends or the family in the village. The queering of the sexual division of labor in male friendships, instantiated in homosocial caring practices, offers us a political opening towards changing gender norms more fundamentally. The queering of cities, when judged based on differences in moral economies of care, may also offer us a political opening to rethink urban spaces. So to the last section of the paper. Dissident friendships, affective communities, cultivated, organized, infinite, and ephemeral. Mumtaz has been best friends, or has been friends with Mukesh a pretty long time, a third friend, Sunil told me in 2016. They're both from Bihar, but their friendship in Okhla, a southeast industrial suburb of Delhi, grew out of the B26 agitation, agitation, Sangharsh. They both used to work in B26, where the workers formed a union in 1996. The workers who had been dismissed were fighting for their rights. Under the leadership of these two, the case is still being fought by workers in the Delhi High Court, Sunil said. Sunil got to know Mumtaz and Mukesh in the context of the D26 agitation because he himself is a community organizer and, um, as we'll see, an independent grassroots journalist. In the 23 years since then, they have formed an affective community of friends, which is quite remarkable. Their friendship pays no heed to caste and religious difference. It is primarily a dependable network of support based on trust, Vishwas, Mumtaz told me, which provides care in multiple registers. Material care comes in the form of sharing money with each other when times are tough, from job loss in the informal economy, or when a financial obligation to one's extended family in the village must be fulfilled. Loans are given by whoever has money at the time and returned whenever, without interest. Care also comes in the form of mediating the state, accompanying each other to access medical care in government hospitals, or staying with one another during hospital stays, for instance. These friends provide each other with information on educational op opportunities for their children. They dispense emotional backing or tough love to each other when it is thought necessary, usually doing better uh, around doing better by their wives, by helping out more with care work in the house, or by doing better to their parents. The power of affect to forge strong communal bonds of horizontal relationality is palpable in their joyful sharing of laughter, song, and food. Feminist scholars have named this form of affiliation dissident friendships, and I quote, anarchic forms of relationality, other directed and affectively singular. I'm quoting Leela Gandhi. Friendships who are, and I quote again, a process of coming to know each other's stories and unlearning an impulse that allows mythologies about each other to replace knowing about one another, to quote Jackie Alexander. Drawing on her experience of collaborating with activists who founded a movement in North India, Richa Nagar coins the term radical vulnerability to embrace friendship that in the walking creates togetherness. She proposes the Bhojpuri term Sangatin used by the movement, best describes the deep emotional bonds and multi-dimensional intimacy, which allows for other forms of companionship beyond narrowly defined organizational goals or those of a political project. 
I'm drawing on these theorizations of friendship to suggest that naming them infinite may better describe the commitments of this particular group of friends to an open future and a politics without guarantees. How did this kind of dosti come to be? What makes it endure? I asked Mumtaz, Mukesh, Sunil, and three other friends just this last Sunday as we sat around chatting, drinking chai in Mukesh's room in Aligarh and later having dinner together. I, do, I didn't know these people before B26, Mumtaz said. I'd seen them in passing because the boundary of Aligarh was not big then. Whenever he saw Mumtaz, Mukesh remembers, here comes the Englishman because he'd wear sunglasses and a hat like an Englishman. Mumtaz agrees, yes, that was so. But these people would also think that I am with the ladies, as I worked on a line with mostly ladies. I rarely brought lunch along at that time. Someone or the other on the line would bring me lunch. These people were on an other line, and they'd say, did you see that? I was put on the line because there were two or three Bengalis on the line, and I'm also from there. That's why all eyes were on that line. Neither Mumtaz nor Mukesh knew what a union was before the B26 agitation. Mukesh recounts, we all sat in garment assembly lines. The person behind me passed on an information sheet saying a union is going to be formed with the piece of the garment to me, and then it went down the line. When I saw that other workers were also filling in the union membership form, I did too. I thought there must be some reason for doing this. That's how I became a union member. Then there was a hartal, a strike, and I was also dismissed after the strike. I wondered, now what? Then I thought, whatever, whoever, however the other union members managed to eat, so will I. In this way, inexorably, the strike went on for six months. Two experiences stand out in Mukesh's subsequent narration of the strike. The first is how he found a place for his true desire to be a singer in the movement, and the second is about singing to spur a brief friendship in prison. Mukesh recounts, during the agitation, many students joined us and they would talk to everybody. Some of them would sing nationalist songs, which I didn't know. My worker friend said, Mukesh also sings. Mukesh, why don't you sing for them? I told my friends, these people sing different songs. One Sati comrade said, do you sing? And I went and admitted, yes, but I sing different kinds of songs. She said, that doesn't matter, sing whatever you know. So I sang, where there's a bird on every bough, that's my India. After that, she talked a lot to me and said she'd introduce me to someone. Shortly after, there was a workshop. She told me to attend it. I was afraid to go all on my own, but I met someone I knew on the railway station, and they told the workshop organizer that Mukesh from Delhi will be attending. I didn't even know what a workshop was then. There were lots of people attending, and it felt great. The workshop was with Gadar, the revolutionary balladeer, but I didn't know what kind of a singer he was. I only knew he was big, and I thought if I meet him, I can also become a big singer. I wanted to make a career out of singing. But after attending the workshop, I wondered, should I make a career in Bombay in the film industry or in the Sankarthanda movement? After considerable thought, I decided I'm going to join the movement and work for society. Working with people in the Sangathan, I understood their thinking. Slowly, over time, my thinking changed, and I, be I began to think like them too. Like-mindedness, apne jaise vichar walo, is a reason that Mumtaz and Sunil also offered for their friendship and for it being sustained over such a long time. This is a like-mindedness that was cultivated. In the village, Mukesh recalls, they told us we were poor because of our karma, whatever it was we'd done in our previous birth. In the Sangathan, we learned that people are poor because capital, punji, is accumulated from our labor. That thinking made sense to me. One of the biggest changes was in Mukesh's attitude to women. In the village, we openly made fun of women, but not a bit of that here. Here, men and women walk together. If anyone were to walk with an unknown woman in the village, people would think something else. A lot of such thoughts would cross my mind. But I didn't join the Sangatan because of the attractive women. I was only drawn to them because of their songs. I was greedy for a place for my songs, and so I joined them. Mukesh's story of joining the union, the Sangatan, learning about capitalism and the language of protest, singing and learning to play the duffly or drum at the workshop, is intertwined with stories of sharing his living spaces with kin and friends. 
We got a taste of the import of sharing spaces of residency and caring in Mumtaz's story. But as we sat around chatting the other day, the friend shared how their own affiliation had also been initially organized by the movement activists around collective living and sharing care. We all lived in different places at the time. All of us were unmarried. One of the middle class organizers suggested, why don't you all stay together? At the time, Aligaon was much smaller. We could find a colony with enough rooms. Colony is a tenement with 10 or hundreds of rooms, some with shared bathrooms and water for washing, others with tiny indoor spaces for this. We occupied five rooms in various combinations of male friends. We shared cooking and cleaning. Whoever came home first was supposed to cook. Of course, sometimes they wouldn't, and then there'd be a falling out. So they kept rearranging who stayed in which room. Every week or two, we would have meetings. One of the activists would share some ideas, and we'd go on questioning and discussing late into the night. Affiliation, in other words, was organized around a pedagogic project, simultaneously ideological critique, embodied, and affective. At the time, another friend, Rabinder, who's also a worker in B26, remembers, if he felt like skipping work one day to roam with friends, we would just do that. In the winter, when it was really cold, we would be low to get out of our warm beds and just blow a day off work. If a factory owner made us do night work or overtime, we just refuse. But things have changed. We were all unmarried and fewer, had fewer responsibilities at the time. Now owners all follow the same stringent modes of controlling labor, so it's harder to move. Fewer and fewer garment sector jobs has meant that the sort of bigger room workers once had, which Rabindra describes, no longer exist. Another change they describe is the individuation of living in the colony. They all still live in tenements in Aligaon, but in different ones. Now, people keep to themselves. They don't know each other's names. They don't even borrow sugar or salt from each other anymore. In those days, we'd even pay each other's rent sometimes, helping out colony dwellers till the money came in. Rabindra thinks that the gender politics of colonies have shifted too. Unmarried men could freely talk to the few married women who lived with their husbands in the colony rooms at that time. Now they are afraid to do so, as they may be excused, accused of sexual harassment. One time when they all lived together in the colony, someone from another colony saw female activists visit and accused them of bringing loose girls over. But the whole colony banded together and defended them. The six or seven middle-class communist organizers who worked closely with the friends over the early years have, for the most part, distanced themselves from them. Ironically, Mumtaz thinks there are divisions of class within the movement. We are all of the same level, he said, talking about the friends. So there's a feeling of brotherhood amongst us. Once you go to a higher level, that becomes difficult. Class differences in the Sangathan are felt most acutely by the friends around their romances, which were set up by the Sangathan and then broken up by the middle class girls they had fallen in love with. Nowadays, they are not invited to social gatherings of the middle class activists in their homes, except when they want Mukesh to perform revolutionary songs. Mukesh doesn't mind doing that, but he refuses to invite them to his house. In contrast, Mukesh remembers another time he performed in Tihar jail quite fondly. I liked Tihar, mujhe pasand laga. He'd been jailed because of his participation in the B26 protests. At the time, a few of us had been rounded up, a few of us had been rounded up were inside the police station, and a few had gone out to drink chai. The police, displaying unexpected compassion, said, let the unmarried ones be jailed, the married ones we let go. I turned to Rabinder, his friend from the village, and said, you go out, I'll go to jail. And he said to me, no, no, you go out, and I'll go to jail. In the end, we both decided to go together to watch out for each other. I'd heard all kinds of things about what they would do to you in jail, but I made a friend. Once we entered, they separated the people who had come in, this thing's having a fit, from those who had been there. This guy, who was the head honcho among the jailed, uh, made each new person sing or tell jokes. I was not getting a turn, so I was slinking to a corner till, I, till he said, sing, sing. I sang two songs and he loved them. He praised me to the sky and patted me on the back. He told me, you don't need to do any work. Just roam around the jail with me and sing. The next time I was sent to Tihar, he befriended me once again. 
In juxtaposing these two incidents, Bokesh talks to the multidimensional strands of relatedness and affect which ground infinite friendships, and in the second, the possibility that even ephemeral friendships are meaningful and noteworthy if they queer an experience, in this case, uh, the experience of the prison. The friends have been infinitely patient waiting for a judgment in the B26 case. Fellow workers have died, some have stopped showing up for meetings, and many have not kept in touch. About seven years ago, they turned down a lower court ruling that awarded them a paltry amount in compensation. Regardless of whether they win or lose the case, the actual owner is and whether the actual owner is brought to justice, their friendship will continue. The last form of dissident friendship uh, takes the dissident friendship takes is standing witness to violence by reporting on everyday structural atrocities to migrants and informal economy workers whose stories are never told. Sunil tra traverses the city and beyond making ephemeral friendships with those who have suffered from being beaten up or evicted, he talks to the families of people who have died in sewages and busti and industrial fires. His compassionate reports aim to move, uh, no to jolt us out of indifference, to stake a claim, a citizen's claim to a just city. Dissident friendships define friendships as an expansive pers personhood and futurity, to quote in Rani Chatterjee. The restoration of dignity may be a key goal of political aspiration of these friendships. Friendships based on an ethic of care to work on relieving the suffering of others rather than dwelling on your own. So to conclude, rad radical geographic practice is about finding wiggle room, Dempsey and Pratt write in a recent keywords in radical geography published by Antipode and freely available for download. The emphasis is on the sweaty, laborious, restless creation and recreation of dominant power, relations, norms, and codes that are in constant parasitic engagement with similarly ceaseless resisting, evading, playing, enduring, inventing, refusing, strategizing, and living according to infinite non or a capitalist capacities and potentials. My attempt in thinking about urban politics in and beyond the city through friendships, specifically male homosocial friendships in Delhi, has been to look for those wiggle rooms. My main arguments to reiterate are first, the social geographies of friendship traverse the urban and rural as inextricably intertwined in the lives of rural migrants who work in the vast informal economy. Urban friendships offer the possibility of imagining a personhood not defined by class and class and offer a pedagogy on privilege. In practice, unfriending may be a necessary strategy against the incessant reproduction of difference tied to residential locality and mentality. Middle migrants may, wiggle, may make wiggle room by moving to another locality in the city or to a provincial town. They may buy land in their village to escape the taunts of privilege. Second, male friendships with provisioned migrant care through the work of tending are embedded in a moral economy of care. These friendships prefigure the move to the city. They are one of capitalism's hidden abodes. Cities are experienced as particular when judged by migrants' moral economies of care. They leave if they are disgusted. Acknowledging male caring friendship opens up the political possibility of querying the gendering of the sexual division of labor and of cities. Dissident friendships form affective communities which practice a horizontal relationality across difference. They, be, they may be infinite, enduring in their futurity, united through the for, forging of strong bonds. Working class friendships may originate in union organizing, but may queer union organizing by not taking brotherhood for granted, critiquing the class divisions of labor that re-emerge between middle class organizers and workers. Ephemeral friendships founded on affect may offer glimpses into queer uh, even core institutions of state power, such as police, thanas, and prisons. And lastly, ephemeral friendships ground grassroots citizen journalism, which speaks truth to power. To end, I'd like to suggest that we think of research, uh, of friendship as a research method as well. Ethnographic research and oral history interviews certainly are founded on friendships. None of our research with rural migrants would have been possible without the friendships which made them possible. Friendships have also educated us to decolonize the constant and limited search for stories and self-narrations only of suffering, violence, and distress. Not for a moment to underplay those, but to accept that people share what they want with friends. In her book, Forgotten Friends, Chatterjee writes, we may be tuned away from listening to histories of friendship because they have been erased from a South Asian historiography 
historiography conceived only in terms of freedoms and rights, products and markets, here and now. She contends that a general refusal of narratives of suffering could also indicate a profusion of an ethics of enormous discipline, the commitment to, cult to and cultivation of compassionate, albeit hierarchized uh, friendships. Mujhe bari khushi hai ki aap hume Mumtaz ji, Mukesh ji, Sunil ji, Ashoka ji yahan pe hain. Unhone mujhe अपनी जीवन कथा बताए ताकि मैं आपको उनकी जीवन कथा बताई मुझे आपको अपनी कहानी बोलने का इजादत भी दी मेरी और आपकी तरह से धन्यवाद सो आई वाज थैंकिंग मुमताज मुकेश एंड सुनील फॉर बीइंग हियर इन द ऑडियंस विद अस देवेंद्र वाज नॉट एबल टू कम papers really left me feel you know so blown away that you know, apart from just saying wow I am really sort of struggling so um, I think that the the vividness with which you evoked people's lives is just uh, extraordinary and what you began with in you know saying that um, Bernstein and others Sanyal who talk about uh, informal workers as part of the surplus, uh, the reserve army of labor, you know, just how far that is from the, from, you know, from, 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 these, from the lives that you described uh, so well. Uh, I suppose the only question that I have, or it's more of a comment, is about the ways in which what you've described gets us back to, in some ways, the original idea of the city as a place where you could encounter people different from oneself. And in a way, the classic modernist conception of the city was that you would meet strangers and forge ties that were across, across differences. So up, I, I don't know if this paper is, um, it, I, I suppose it presents only one aspect of your work, but uh, what it does, I wonder whether you would locate it within other ways in which your, uh, the narratives that you have shed light on other aspects of being in the city. But it, does, it did make me think that, you know, in some ways that is the promise of the city, that you can be something um, more than just the sum of your ascribed identity and that you can have relations with people across those identities. I would like to say that I don't know how much you have प्रीति जी का पेपर कितना आ, समझ में आया लेकिन आ, सुन के मान लीजिए आंखों में आंसू आ गए क्योंकि उन्होंने आप लोगों की दोस्ती और आपके जीवन के बारे में इतनी सुंदर तरीके से बताया है कि आ, ऐसे लगता है कि दिल्ली में कुछ उम्मीद है कुछ आगे बदलने की हम सब में जो इच्छा है वो किसी किसी दिन आगे शायद सच्ची हो सकती है तो आप लोगों ने इनके साथ जो शेयर के लिए किया उसके लिए धन्यवाद Yeah, that was, uh, to me, too, really a, a very, very um, just beautiful account, I think, of, of people's lives. And I think the one thing that I just wanted you to maybe comment on a little bo bit more, which I think struck me, was that uh, you really sort of reversed this sort of imaginative hierarchy of the city being the refuge from the caste uh, relations. And now you have people fleeing, in a sense, for refuge to the small town. Uh, from the sort of, uh, you know, from the sort of exclusions of caste in the big city, which I thought was a very interesting reversal of the kind of classic uh, narratives of the big city and the small town. So I thought maybe a little bit more about that would be lovely. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the beautiful talk. Um, I had a, a question about, and I'm very excited by the idea of friendship as both an analytic and as a methodology and can totally relate to uh, that. And I'm thinking of uh, how are you thinking of friendship in relation to kinship, uh, which was seen as pervasive in the agrarian rural sphere 
and stranger sociality, which is seen to be sort of the urban experience. And friendship seems to cut across these in surprising ways in your work. For example, with Devinder's drawings, it's in the, in the village that he actually has this rich world of friends. Um, so just thinking about how do you situate friendship? Thank you. Yeah, maybe take one more. Since all my friends have asked questions, I'm glad that I don't know you before. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm not a planted question for sure, uh, but um, um, no, no, I don't mean that, but I'm just, uh, I'm just uh, I just want to also echo the, um, the beautiful presentation that you made, and as a labor historian, I was really struck by the lack of any accounts uh, of friendship in classical labor studies that still focus on industrial labor and settled labor. And I thought, uh, to what extent do you feel that uh, it's those biases of uh, studying a, a certain kind of uh, working class that um, friendship as, a, as an analytical uh, category has eluded studies of work and that it has been restricted to family or social relations uh, that emerge from union solidarity, for example, but not uh, you know, this kind of brothers from a different mother kind of beautiful uh, relationship that you uh, conveyed. Thank you. Um, so uh, let me try and uh, uh, respond uh, to some of those. Um, so um, I, I think you know, Amita was asking uh, what some of our other stories uh, uh, reveal about this sort of pull of the city which goes back you know, so to the classic idea of the, the cosmopolitan city, right? That you could be cosmopolitan. You could leave these very narrow ways of uh, defining identity and affinity uh, behind. Um, and I, I think a, a, a lot of uh, you know, really good work has been uh, done uh, to show uh, how these still stick in place. Um, I think partly what our work has uh, tried to do uh, is to show what we call the intersectional politics uh, of uh, social reproduction and, and something else that we've written, uh, which tries to think about uh, gender and caste, or caste and class in this case, together, right? So the ways in which these tend to be co-constituted means that one might, in fact, escape normative uh, gender norms, right? So I'm thinking of one very vivid example of somebody from one of these uh, Bihari villages who is a Rajput. And she was somebody who had to have her uh, sari low. Uh, she literally did not know her way around uh, the village she was married into because she had never been out of the house. Uh, but somehow she escaped uh, and came away uh, to various cities. Delhi was where she uh, is now and where we interviewed her. Uh, and now she has a job. And one of the things that has allowed her to have a job or has forced her into having a job is the violence of her husband. Right. So she has managed to get a job to work and that modicum of income has given her a certain amount of uh, distance from this man, even though he continues to live with her. So in her case, gender normativity has been broken. But and uh, even at work, caste normativity, because a Rajput woman cleaning toilets in Delhi University, which is what she does, would never be acceptable. But at the same time, she has not told anybody in her circle of friends, either in the Basti or in the village, that she is now working and what kind of work she does. So I think the point is then that certain identities may be solidified and really difficult to wiggle out of. Uh, whereas others, in certain instances, in certain experiences, in certain spheres of uh, living, uh, are more easy to bend. Um, so, so Karen, I, I think this provincial town and the way that the village becomes a place of possibility is something that really struck us. Um, you know, we didn't go in expecting it. Um, and, but we did go in thinking that we do want to think about these entanglements in very heterogeneous ways. And then lo and behold, you know, when I went back with uh, Devendra, so uh, 
I can tell you a little bit about our research methodologies. I went back with uh, Mumtaz, with Mukesh, with Sunil, and with Devendra to their villages. So another way that they have been extremely generous with me is uh, by allowing me to go home uh, with them uh, to their village homes as well. So when we went back with Devendra, uh, we actually found that uh, he sort of wanted us to spend a lot of time in this provincial town. And I kept saying, but we need to go to the village, we need to go to the village. And he kept wanting me to stay in this place. Now, what's interesting is that in Fatehpur, they actually live in a colony that's called Ambedkar Nagar. Right? So caste is in a way, again, being produced in the provincial town. But these are all educated Dalits. And that makes a huge difference. Right? So again, I think that so much more work needs to be done to think about what is happening in these provincial towns. You know, where is the capital coming from? Uh, where are people's aspirations meeting with that capital? Because Devendra's father says, I need more capital to actually do something that can provide me with a livelihood there. You know, I need a wider array of products. So I think that there's a lot more work uh, that I hope you know, some of you in the audience uh, will take up and do. Um, in the first question about friendship versus kinship is really interesting. And I think, you know, some those few ethnographies of uh, friendship, they feel the need to take on kinship. And one of the things that's interesting is that they say that moving to friendship might actually decolonize anthropology. Because uh, if you think of the earlier roots of anthropology, Anthropology was so invested in kinship as a structure, right? It was busy proving itself as another science, right? So in fact, and especially in India, as we know, we got so utcode in studies of kinship that maybe it put a certain set of blinkers on the ways we can think outside of that. Uh, so certainly, you know, I, I hope that friendship will allow us uh, to do some different kinds of work. The other response is that uh, maybe this term Kin friends is a useful one to use. Because if you think of our own lives, you know, we aren't friends with all our kin, thankfully, right? <laughs> We're only friends with some of our kin. So maybe kin friends is a good way of also thinking about this. Um, and then the, the last uh, question about labor studies uh, is, uh, is one that uh, Vinay and I, Vinay Gidwani and I, uh, have been kind of acutely aware of, uh, because both of us come from labor studies and actually agrarian political economy. Um, Vinay at least had done some work with uh, waste workers, but for me, this foray into the urban is completely new and and pretty alien. Actually, uh, I feel much happier uh, working in the village. So uh, we have, in fact. Uh, thought through this carefully um, and do think uh, that, uh, you know, we need other approaches to this. Um, I haven't yet uh, pushed friendship in the direction of what it would mean to rethink labor studies, except the feminist work on care and caring labor. So that is a project which uh, still needs to emerge. Um, since I was writing this paper, since Till this morning, I, I have a few excuses uh, for not actually taking on that literature yet. Well, I think our, our time is just about up. Uh, so I wanted to thank all of you for, for coming and, and for your attention and questions, uh, and to you for the, the wonderful talk. So have a great rest of the conference, and, uh, and thank you. Bye.